and welcome to today's webinar, Expanding Treatment Options for Youth with Psoriasis. My name is Bev Bromfield, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined this presentation using your computer's speaker system by default. This means if you hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select Use Telephone in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. In addition to pre-submitted questions, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions today by typing into the questions pane on the control panel. You can send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address as many as possible during the Q&A session with today's speaker, pediatric dermatologist, Dr. James Tree. Before I provide information about the foundation, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, Amgen, Jamson, Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, Lilly, and Novartis for their support of today's webinar. Since some of you may be new to the foundation, here's a little background about who we are, our mission, and what we do. For over 50 years, the National Psoriasis Foundation has served more than 8 million individuals in the U.S. living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Founded from a tiny classified newspaper ad in Portland, Oregon, the NPF mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. After completing one of the most ambitious strategic plans in its history, NPF launched a new five-year strategic plan in July 2019. With a continued focus on a life free of psoriatic disease and its burdens, NPF remains committed to finding a cure for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis while supporting individuals to live longer and healthier lives. Over the five years, NPF will focus on achieving three goals, lead collaborative transformational research in psoriatic disease, increase the lifespan and health of individuals living with psoriatic disease, secure the human, technological, and financial resources necessary to achieve NPS mission-related goals. By viewing today's program, you've taken a step towards expanding your knowledge about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, moving towards a better understanding of what it means to live with psoriatic disease. A few of the many ways that NPF supports the goal of leading collaborative transformational research includes, today NPF has funded close to 30 million in grants and fellowships. This includes almost 3 million in grant and fellowship funding announced July 2nd. NPF grant mechanisms support all stages of research and careers. Our efforts focus on areas of unmet need and are often conducted in partnership with research stakeholders with whom we collaborate. In addition to funding outside grants and fellowships, NPF also leads research initiatives such as the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative and the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant. The Psoriasis Prevention Initiative was developed at the recommendation of the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative Steering Committee, who urged the definition of prevention to better guide the proposal development. And that's how it expanded to include disease relapse and comorbidities. Now in phase two of the funding cycle, NPF plans to invest $6.5 million over five years in this effort. The second initiative is the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which aims to develop a diagnostic test for psoriatic arthritis. Now in the third year of funding, this grant funds projects that will significantly reduce the time between onset of symptoms and a diagnosis. This is important because we know as little as six months of delay between onset of symptoms of psoriatic arthritis and start of treatment can lead to permanent joint damage. This slide highlights four NPF research efforts that you can be part of. Launched in 2015, the NPF Corivitas National Psoriasis Patient Registry, formerly known as CORONA, is the largest independent observational registry of psoriasis patients in the U.S. This registry collects and studies patient health information, allowing researchers to compare the safety and efficacy of psoriasis treatments, better understand conditions that are related to psoriasis, and explore the history of the disease. There are currently more than 12,700 patients enrolled at more than 521 sites across the country. Your dermatologist may be enrolled as an NPF Corivitas National Psoriasis Patient Registry site. Not sure if they are, ask. If they're not, encourage them to join. Citizen Scientist is a platform where you as a patient answer survey questions, which you and researchers can analyze for trends and new insights. Citizen Scientist is currently being revitalized for greater community benefit. 
The LIGHT study is a real-world research study that compares the effectiveness of home versus office-based UVB phototherapy treatment of psoriasis. Entry criteria for the study are simple. You must be age 12 or older, have plaque or good date psoriasis, and be a candidate for office or home phototherapy. There's no washout of topical, oral, or biologic medications, and the study is designed to be easily incorporated into routine patient care. It is also unique because it includes equal representation of all skin phototypes. The NPF annual survey is a data collection effort the foundation has conducted for two decades. This important research conducted each fall provides insight into the lived experience of individuals with psoriasis, including quality of life and unmet needs. If you are contacted about this annual survey, we would appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. To achieve the Foundation's goals as mentioned, please support our mission through donations or by participating in virtual or live team NPF events such as Stamp Out Psoriasis Walk or Cycle events. You can learn more at psoriasis.org forward slash donate or teamnpf.org. On behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you for attending today's webinar. Will you learn more about how the presentation of psoriasis may be different in children from adults? the importance of pediatric management and treatment of psoriasis guidelines, current and upcoming treatment options for use with psoriasis, resources to help learn more about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in children and teens. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, pediatric dermatologist, Dr. James Treat. Dr. Treat is a pediatric dermatologist with the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine, Dermatology Section at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, also known as CHOP, where he is also a professor of clinical pediatrics and dermatology. Additionally, Dr. Treat is the Education Director of Pediatric Dermatology and the Fellowship Director of Pediatric Dermatology at CHOP, where he has received numerous awards for excellence in clinical teaching. Dr. Treat specializes in the treatment of complex medical dermatological diseases, such as psoriasis, dermatologic manifestations of infectious diseases, atopic dermatitis, and more. He works in partnership with his patients and families to understand their needs and identify the most effective treatment options that will help improve their disease. Given such expertise in pediatric dermatology, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. James Tree, who will present today's webinar, Expanding Treatment Options for Youth with Psoriasis. Please welcome Dr. Tree. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I have no significant financial uh, disclosures with this talk. Um, I do consulting for a small company called Pelvella. Um, take control over this. Cool. So Bev, when I click now, it, oh, there we go. It was just slow. Okay, cool. So um, I wanted to bring uh, a bunch of um, pictures in the beginning just to show some differences with the way pediatric psoriasis presents um, versus the way adult psoriasis presents. And also talk a little bit about how psoriasis presents in skin of color, because I think it's not emphasized uh, enough in medical education. And it may not have been something that uh, if your child has skin of color or if you have skin of color uh, was actually noticed right away. And it's really important from an educational standpoint to kind of understand the differences and understand uh, that psoriasis uh, can look different with different amounts of melanin. So I, I remember taking care of one of my first patients with psoriasis when I had graduated from dermatology residency and uh, the patient had psoriasis on their face and I had not seen that during derm residency in adults. Most of the adults I'd seen had arms and legs and back and scalp, et cetera. Um, and this uh, young child had it on her eyelids as well as her forehead and her cheeks. And I asked our psoriasis experts uh, in the adult world, um, and she said that she doesn't usually see that, but that is absolutely a pediatric um, uh, way that uh, psoriasis manifests. Um, so you can certainly see it on the face, uh, and that uh, brings up other kind of treatment uh, um, paradigms because it's important to make sure that we're using medications that are safe for the face. Um, and then psoriasis also, I didn't put a picture on here just because of the um, kind of public nature of this talk, but psoriasis can also present in the groin in children. So if you think about it, psoriasis often presents in frictional areas. So elbows, knees are kind of classic, um, but where's the most frictional area in a six month old? It's typically in their diaper area. So uh, they, may, they may not be you know, crawling or moving around as much, but their diaper area is getting friction from wipes as well as diapers. So there's a lot of diaper or napkin psoriasis that, that shows up first in infancy. 
And then there's a special type of psoriasis that's a little bit more common in pediatrics, which is called guttate psoriasis, which basically looks like little dew drops or kind of splatters of psoriasis on the trunk. Um, and that's in the bottom right corner of your, of your slide, where essentially you see all these little round uh, spots of psoriasis. And in pediatrics, especially, that is often uh, a marker of having um, uh, a strep infection driving the psoriasis, which can actually be partially good news, which I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and then looking again uh, in children or people with skin of color, psoriasis is classically said to kind of be red with a silvery scale. Well, in people who have some melanin in their skin, uh, it's gonna look a little bit more purple or a little bit darker red and then have a scale that often is actually easier to see. Um, but it still has the kind of the same plaques, et cetera. So important for medical professionals um, as well as parents to kind of understand what psoriasis looks like in different um, skin tones. Great. So just another example of psoriasis in, in skin of color, which um, uh, can look a little different in the scalp also. So uh, we often see kids with um, a lot of scaling and some dispigmentation where there are some areas which are lighter and some areas which are darker. Um, and in children who have uh, a lighter skin tone, uh, it tends to look red and scaly um, and they can be kind of thick plaques in the scalp also. So psoriasis is common, as, as I imagine you know, 1% um, of all children have some version of psoriasis um, or something in that range. Uh, so there are lots of different age groups that when it can show up, it can absolutely show up in infancy, but uh, the most typical age is between seven and 10 which is interesting because that's when a lot of strep throat shows up. So I think in, in pediatrics, there is a, an over-representation of psoriasis that is driven by strep versus, versus in adults. And often there's a first degree relative um, who has psoriasis. And the way I usually ask that is, you know, does somebody have um, significant dandruff or does someone have something that they've had, they've, it's been called eczema, but it's been really recalcitrant or difficult to treat. And often that's actually psoriasis. Um, things like eczema, one of the questions that, that um, someone asked, you know, how do you differentiate eczema from psoriasis? Psoriasis really likes the scalp. It really likes those kind of external skin folds. So the, um, the elbow, the knee, the intergluteal cleft in between where the two um, buttocks kind of come together. Um, it'll often be in the armpits. And those are areas where you don't get a lot of atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, so uh, it tends to show up in different areas. And then eczema, when you put topical steroids on it, generally gets better fairly quickly. So it may not stay better, but it generally gets better fairly quickly. Whereas when you put topical steroids on psoriasis, yes, it can improve, um, but often it takes uh, a few weeks and often you have to use much more potent topical steroids in order to get psoriasis to improve. Uh, so those are some of the kind of main clinical differences. Eczema tends to be a little bit more itchy than psoriasis also, although psoriasis certainly can be very itchy. So the other thing that's been recognized over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, which um, again, thank you to the National Psoriasis Foundation for putting this together and for funding a lot of the research that's actually led to some of these breakthroughs, um, is that there's really a higher level of multiple different medical um, conditions with psoriasis. And so from a, from a provider standpoint, it's really important that we recognize that because we want to be screening for these. So um, children with psoriasis tend to have a higher body mass index. That's not always the case, but they tend to have a higher body mass, mass index. And there's some evidence that if the body mass index is lowered, uh, that psoriasis can be easier to treat. Um, they tend to have um, a, an association with, psori with arthritis, and parents are often very um, fearful of psoriasis and are in, in psoriasis. But fortunately, it's only 5 or 10% of patients who actually get arthritis. Um, and then there is a higher rate of um, mental health disorders. So depression and anxiety um, uh, certainly can go along with psoriasis. And they're really more than just kids don't like what their skin looks like, which is true in lots of dermatologic diseases. There seems to be some special correlation with psoriasis where there are, are distinctly higher rates um, of anxiety and depression. And it's really important, again, for us as providers to understand that and help families um, understand that and uh, and help children kind of get help when they need it. And, you know, I, I always tell people my job is to get your psoriasis as much better as possible. And it's also to identify if you have any um, other comorbidities so that we can get you plugged in with the right specialist to kind of take care of those because there's a little higher rate of diabetes, again, um, depression, anxiety. This was actually a larger study looking at lots of comorbidities. And you can see there, there's a pretty long list here. They're, they're in categories. So 
you know, cardiovascular disease or heart disease you may have heard about. So in, in especially in adults, um, a higher association with having um, uh, elevated cholesterol, um, having uh, things like high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, um, and then also associations with things like inflammatory bowel disease. And, and before you start thinking that, you know, you have to worry about all of these things, these rates are still fairly low, but they're, they're not, they're above the, the, the normal population. And because they're above the normal population um, or the, the population that doesn't have psoriasis, it's important for us to recognize them so that we can uh, help, um, help address them. And so the, the average, the typical person with psoriasis is not gonna get inflammatory bowel disease, is not gonna get heart disease, but they, they do have a higher risk than someone who doesn't have psoriasis. Um, and that's why it's even more important to kind of do some screening along the way. And so there's probably a correlation between the severity of the psoriasis. So if you have a lot of psoriasis, then it's a little, it's probably more likely that you're gonna have this kind of elevated risk of cardiovascular disease over your lifetime um, versus someone who only has a couple of plaques of psoriasis, although that's still being worked out. And then again, at the bottom, uh, um, uh, mental uh, health issues such as depression and anxiety, and even things like suicidal ideation and substance abuse are more common in, in children who have psoriasis or people who have psoriasis. Uh, and they're things that sometimes they don't talk to their dermatologist about, but they really should, because uh, even though we may not be the experts in taking care of those things, we are a gateway into recognizing that they are an association and, and getting people uh, help. So this is uh, some guidelines that were put out a couple of years ago uh, by Joel Gelfand and his group and, and Larry Eichenfield, who's um, one of the uh, pediatric psoriasis experts in San Diego. And essentially what they said was, um, how should we be following children with psoriasis? And, and again, this, this may not apply necessarily to patients who have one plaque of psoriasis or had psoriasis very briefly and then kind of have a huge remission. But for children with really significant psoriasis, you wanna be looking at their body mass index and trying to have them have as healthy a weight as possible. Um, you wanna consider um, screening their glucose. So we're looking to make sure that they don't develop diabetes. Uh, and then also looking at their lipids and making sure that they're not developing high um, cholesterol. So uh, high, Cholesterol is, is significantly associated with cardiovascular disease, as is psoriasis, and we want to make sure that someone doesn't have both things. And then blood pressure, same idea. Um, an ALT is a liver function test that we um, will often screen for also uh, in children because it's associated with this kind of metabolic syndrome of high lipids and high blood pressure. And again, not every child with psoriasis needs this, but if someone has severe psoriasis, um, it's important to every once in a while uh, look and, and kind of screen for these other comorbidities that are often being screened for at these ages anyway. So um, children get their lipids checked, they should be getting blood pressures checked, and they occasionally get liver function checks for other things. But in psoriasis, we know that we have to be more diligent. And then I think the, really the most important thing to screen for, because it's not going to just show up in numbers and, and it's really common in children, uh, is making sure that there aren't any behavioral health issues that are that are happening because of their psoriasis or in association with their psoriasis. Um, so generally, there is a higher rate of anxiety and depression, and sometimes kids don't want to say anything about it. They they don't um, feel comfortable or they don't know who to tell. Um, and so we'll we'll ask people like you know on a scale from one to ten, how much does your psoriasis bother you? Has anyone teased you at school? Do you get bullied because of your psoriasis? Um, does your psoriasis get in the way of you doing any activities that you want to do? You know, will you not go swimming because of your psoriasis? All of those things are really important. And then, and then lastly, screening, um, as we do in pediatrics uh, in, in um, children who are this age, screening for substance abuse to make sure that children haven't started um, uh, with using that as a way of tolerating the fact that they have some anxiety or depression. So um, this, the beginning part of this talk kind of has a lot of you know, things to worry about. I'll tell you that the, the next part of the talk has a lot of amazing things to be really excited about um, because we have a way better um, way of treating patients with psoriasis than we used to. So topical management of psoriasis, you may have had experience in your own family, is, is effective for small areas. Um, you usually have to kind of continue using therapy in order to get things better. And you often have to use very potent topical steroids. So things that are off-label like clobetazole um, is a very potent steroid and it can thin out the skin and, uh, and cause you know, things like stretch marks. And it's important that we're using them uh, um, cautiously but we often have to use them consistently because of the fact that the psoriasis doesn't get that much better. 
And then there are some non-steroids. So there are things like um, uh, calcipatriene or calcitriol, which are vitamin D uh, agents, which can help be steroid sparing agents, meaning it helps you use less steroid. And then there are things like calcineurin inhibitors like pimecrolimus or tacrolimus, um, even off-label, something like um, uh, crisoborol, um, um, they can have some benefit for psoriasis. And, and there are studies showing that topical agents can be very effective, but again, you have to be very diligent applying them. Um, people don't often like to be greasy, and often when you stop, things will come back. Uh, so they're, they can be frustrating for parents, and we, we um, absolutely get that in pediatrics. So this is a, uh, just something you may not have heard of, but basically um, there is this kind of tight association with guttate psoriasis. So psoriasis where it looks like splatter paints of, of um, individual spots of psoriasis, looks like someone um, uh, kind of like lots of little circles of psoriasis. Um, and uh, guttate psoriasis is strongly associated with strep infections in children. And so um, this is a study that was uh, not something that's for every child, but basically they looked to see whether if they took out the tonsils of children, which should lower their rate of strep infections, could they make their psoriasis better? Um, and they found a really significant reduction in psoriasis if you take out um, kids' tonsils. This is not for everyone with psoriasis. This is not for typical psoriasis, but this is for children who clearly have a positive strep throat when they get their psoriasis and the strep makes their psoriasis worse. Um, and if that's happening over and over and over and they're having difficulty clearing the strep, so they get antibiotics, maybe they get you know, preventative antibiotics, um, they make sure that they're looking for strep carriers in the family. If none of that is working, then it is not unreasonable to consider a tonsillectomy with, you know, with the discussion with your own doctor to decide whether if strep is, is a key trigger whether you can actually um, change someone's psoriasis course by essentially having them not get strep infections again. Tonsillectomy or removing the tonsils, of course, has risk to it in and of itself, um, but this is something that, uh, that is um, uh, certainly done in pediatrics sometimes, and I've had patients who've had this done and, and have it really make a big difference for their psoriasis. So um, this is, again, uh, kind of more data. Um, so if you have a single episode of tonsillitis, it's not really highly associated. Um, but if you have recurrent um, episodes of tonsillitis, so if you have recurrent strep throat, uh, then that can be associated with psoriasis. So um, again, not for everyone, but for some kids. So you know, what are your therapy options for psoriasis? Because I think that's really the main point, is, is how can we make people better? Um, so topical steroids, tar solutions, topical vitamin D, we talked about those a little bit. You do have to be careful in adolescents. Um, adolescents are very smart and they realize that the topical steroids are the thing that's working and then they end up um, potentially overusing them. Um, kids can get striae or, or stretch marks on their inner parts of their thighs, their inner arms, along the sides of the breasts. Um, any kind of sensitive skin areas. So we want to limit the amount of topical steroids um, children use, and we want to kind of use them for a few days at a time and then take breaks or a couple weeks with a week off or something like that in order to make sure that they're not getting any skin thinning. And then there are both on-label and off-label therapies for psoriasis. So things like narrowband UVB or eczema laser, where essentially you shine um, the narrowband UVB in with a laser at a very small area, can be very effective. Um, but again, when you stop them, uh, the psoriasis tends to come back. So it's a little bit limited in terms of how long you go or how many treatments you give. And typically these things are done in the office, although it is possible to get a light booth at home. Um, and so it can be hard to come to the office 20, 30, 40 times to get a big benefit, um, but uh, again, has a good safety profile. This is something that uh, has been used for a long time and, and seems to be reasonable. Methotrexate and cyclosporin are some of the older school medications for psoriasis that we still use. Uh, they turn down the immune system more broadly, but they kind of turn down psoriasis in, in the way. Um, and they require some blood work and they require frequent visits and they do have some risks of side effects, including infection. And so, um, and they don't quite work um, as well as the newer agents that we have for psoriasis. Acetretin is one that you may not have heard of. It's, it's a topical vitamin A analog. Um, it is um, very teratogenic, meaning it, it um, is very harmful for a fetus um, in a pregnant mom. So it's really usually only offered to um, men um, or to very young girls, um, like you know, two, three, four years old who aren't anywhere close to having a baby. Um, and it's, it can be effective for pustular psoriasis. Uh, it still does require some lab work. It can make the skin very dry. 
um, but it's nice for parents who don't want to feel like they're on an immunosuppressing medication, especially during a pandemic, because acetretin is not an immunosuppressing medication. And then TNF-alpha blockades, so things like etanercept and adalimumab. Um, uh, I'll, go, I'll show you some of the data in a second, but etanercept is actually FDA approved down to the age of four for psoriasis, which is um, fantastic. Uh, we used to not have anything that was approved down to that age, um, um, but it, it's really been nice to have things that are approved uh, very young. And then IL-12, IL-23 blockade, and IL-17 blockade. So um, we now have multiple medications, and I'll go through some of them, which are approved um, at young ages, including usikenumab um, and ixikizumab and secikinumab. Um, and you may know from adult psoriasis, there are lots of medications that have been approved in the last five or 10 years, which are extremely effective. The quote unquote biologic medications, um, which are um, typically injectable medications, um, are extremely effective. And some of them have now been approved in children, which is great. Um, uh, um, one of the medications that's not approved in children um, uh, is a Tesla, um, which I apologize, I'm using the brand name. Uh, a premolast, excuse me, because I was blanking on the generic name. Uh, but premolast um, is not approved in children, uh, although we sometimes use it off-label, and that is an oral medicine uh, that that can be used also, um, again, off-label, meaning not approved by the FDA. So you can think about a PASI 75 as roughly 75% better. Um, so uh, in um, acetretin gets about 50% of people, roughly 75% better. Methotrexate gets about 34% of people and cyclosporin about 40% of people. So if you take someone who has psoriasis, like the, the gentleman in this picture, um, and you tell them that they have to do blood work and they have to come to a lot of visits and they have about a 40% chance of, of getting 75% you know, better, they may or may not think that that's worth it. Although in pediatrics, often these numbers are a little bit higher. So this is kind of all comers, including adults in pediatrics. Um, and children, because they're, they generally are medication naive, they haven't seen a lot of medications along the way, things often work better. Um, and we can also weight-based dose them. But still, it's, it's not ideal and, uh, and they don't always work. And they do have significant side effects. All, all three of these medications have potential significant side effects. Um, so uh, a couple of things in children, we have to balance as providers how, man, how much we're doing blood work. So you know, if, we're, if we have someone on cyclosporin and they have to do blood work really frequently, the, the fear of the blood work may actually outweigh the, the benefit that you're actually getting from the medicine. Um, and then we also have to be careful of what other comorbidities someone has. So if they have a high body mass index, we want to be careful with methotrexate because that can cause fatty liver disease um, and uh, we want to be careful. And then we usually do typically check for a quantifiron gold or, or a PPD before starting um, any of the systemic therapies for psoriasis um, um, because there is an association with worsening tuberculosis. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, um, but, uh, but generally, at least for the biologics, you have to check before starting those. So there are some things that you want to kind of be careful of. The other thing to be careful of is that if you have a five or eight-year-old and they need their pills crushed or they need uh, liquid medicine, and you're giving them something like methotrexate or acetretin, um, those are teratogenic or they're, they're harmful to pregnant patients. And although the patients may not be pregnant, the mothers who are handling the medication may be pregnant. So it's important to be aware of that. So this is a patient who has severe psoriasis, um, really not realistic to think that they're gonna be able to get topical medicine all over. Um, and so you'd consider things like light therapy, um, but if they weren't getting better, you'd definitely wanna consider whether to use a biologic medication. So what are our options? Um, Etanercept was approved a few years ago um, in 2016, approved all the way down to the age of four. It's weight-based dosing. It's generally given once a week, um, which is a lot of injections. Um, but it's generally very effective, uh, and um, uh, there do need to be, you know, larger studies along the way. We haven't given it to children for a long time, but but actually, if you count the rheumatoid arthritis literature and the psoriasis literature, this has actually been a drug that's been used for a while um, and has generally been very safe. All of the um, um, medications that turn down the immune system have these, you know, small or theoretical risks of severe infections. Um, theoretical risks of malignancy, including lymphoma, um, or small risks of those things, uh, and then risks of unusual infections like tuberculosis, especially with these kind of TNF-alpha medications. Um, Ustekinumab uh, has, um, was approved down to the age of 12 for a while and actually is now approved down to the age of six, which is fantastic. 
Um, the, one of the benefits of this medication is that um, it is uh, only given every 12 weeks after you do the loading doses. And so giving an injection every 12 weeks is, is usually more um, palatable to children. And the improvement in the skin is really pretty fantastic. So 80% um, getting a pasty 75 or 75% better at 12 weeks. Um, and there is some newer data um, that was used to kind of support the down to six years of age um, um, dosing that, that's now used. And then even more recently, ixacizumab and um were both approved down to the age of six. And these PASI scores are even higher. So um, ixacizumab you know, talks about a PASI 100, which is basically 100% of children getting better, um, uh, sorry, of children getting 100% better and about 50% of them had that happen. Um, and it was very helpful for scalp and genital disease, which is kind of very challenging to treat. Um, and secacinumab uh, also um, very beneficial, uh, and this uh, was really um, directly correlated uh, against um, other kind of biologic medications and shown to be very effective, um, including uh, it more effective um, uh, than uh, the Tanercept that was in here. So um, uh, this is on label for ixacizumab. We just looked at that data. So also there's lots of things on the horizon. So there are other parts of the pathway that are gonna be um, targeted. So there are IL-23 alone inhibitors that are approved in adults that hopefully will be approved in children at some point. Um, and there are other um, uh, biologics that are again improved in adults and hopefully will be approved in the future, including gaselcomab. Um, and we are hoping to have more and more options, although we really appreciate um, having pharmaceutical companies do the trials in children to be able to get us the options that we have now. And it's exciting to um, have children who used to just really struggle with topical medicines be um, have access to the uh, systemic medications that can really make a huge difference when they have moderate or severe um, uh, plaque psoriasis. So um, one other just special note that, that you may not have heard of is there is something called um, paradoxical psoriasis. Um, so paradoxical psoriasis is usually children who don't start with psoriasis, but they start with something else like rheumatoid arthritis or they start with inflammatory bowel disease. And um, uh, the TNF alpha medications can occasionally cause psoriasis to, to happen in these patients. So if you start with psoriasis, TNF alpha medications are great. They tend to treat their psoriasis. So things like adalimumab or etanercept or infliximab can make psoriasis a lot better. But if you don't start with psoriasis and instead you start with inflammatory bowel disease, you can occasionally get this kind of very severe form of psoriasis from your TNF alpha inhibitor. And I think it's important just to know that um, just in case that uh, you know, um, your provider um, wasn't aware of that. So this is called anti-TNF alpha psoriasis. It is paradoxical because it's being caused by a drug that usually treats psoriasis. And what we typically do is we switch, switch to a drug that hopefully treats their, for instance, inflammatory bowel disease and their psoriasis. And something like ustekinumab um, uh, is, is a good choice for that and has been used in a lot of those patients. Um, so you, the mechanism for this is uh, um, uh, probably not that interesting to people, but it's not the same mechanism as regular psoriasis. And so it actually is, is shorter lived and tends to go away when you stop the um, TNF alpha um, agent. So the bottom line is that pediatric psoriasis can present in unusual ways, um, and uh, it can be really emotionally challenging for children. And there are newer therapies now that are approved for children, which is really exciting. And then there are other kind of like scaling diseases that kind of look like psoriasis that actually have taken advantage of some of these psoriasis um, medications also um, and, and had them be really helpful. And again, the National Psoriasis Foundation is a really fantastic resource for people. So if you, you know, if you have a patient who's, or a, pa a child who's struggling, or if you need to kind of get plugged in with various different programs or research programs, um, contact the National Psoriasis Foundation. They have a, a fantastic um, a network of providers who they know of, um, who are really the experts in the field who can get you plugged in. So thanks for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Treat. Uh, we do have some questions for you. Uh, that was a great presentation. And uh, some of the questions that we have will relate to a lot of the information that you provided. Uh, so one question is, if a teenager is on a biologic, uh, what is the likelihood that he or she will find that it stops working for them in a year or two? So that's interesting. Again, I think children are, are generally different than adults because they generally 
do better than adults, but but we do see um, that there's a small percentage of people where their effect either plateaus and they just don't get quite as much better as they thought they were going to, or they get better and then um, the benefit recedes. And, and some of that um, might be that they're outgrowing the dose. So if you start a 10 year old on a medication and it's the same dose that they would get when they were 15, if they're just bigger, they might just you know have outgrown the dose and, and so that the, they outgrow the benefit. But I'd say you know somewhere between around 10% of people will get some significant uh, reflaring and need to kind of change medications or consider um, adding a medication depending on kind of what they started with. Um, but most patients, once they get on a stable dose of something, they, they tend to continue to uh, stay in, in good shape. Do you use any oral treatments for kids with psoriasis? I do, and I didn't mean to gloss them over. We certainly still use oral methotrexate, and we occasionally use cyclosporin when we need to kind of like shut down psoriasis as soon as possible. I would like to be able to use more apremolast. It's just hard to get, um, and uh, um, because of the FDA approval. Um, and uh, in terms of other oral agents, acetretin is an oral medicine, um, and we certainly use some acetretin. Um, it just ends up being that the oral medicines tend to um, require more lab work, except for um, apremolast. Uh, and they tend to be a little bit um, more difficult uh, to tolerate sometimes, but they're very reasonable and, um, and we certainly have used them over time. The, the biologic medications often, even though it's an injection, tend to require less blood work and tend to be um, very well tolerated by the kids. But again, they, they certainly have risk, risks and side effects also. So speaking of safety, um, Based on the current evidence, which biologics are really safe and effective? So that is a loaded question. Um, so uh, they all have very similar, very good safety. Um, there are very diff there are slight idiosyncrasies between the medicines, but um, when something's FDA approved, I, I think when when the FDA approves something in children, I think it's a very strong statement that they think that it's very reasonably safe for what we're treating. So, you know, the fact that etanercept is approved and has been used for a long time, ustekinumab is approved and been used for a long time, secukinumab and ixekizumab are approved. They've been using for a little bit less time in children, but been used for a long time in adults. I think all of those are very reasonable um, and they have reasonable safety. There are, again, slight idiosyncrasy um, differences between them um, in terms of um, signals for different associated diseases that you kind of have to go through with your doctor to, to decide which one's which. But I think that the, the corollary question to that question is, what's the danger in not treating? So for instance, you have a teenager who comes in, they have 20% of their body surface area covered with psoriasis, they're miserable in school, they won't take off their shirt to go swimming, or you know, get into a bathing suit. Um, they uh, um, won't hang out with their friends because they're feeling socially awkward. Those things can lead to real mental health issues or anxiety um, and kind of uh, feeling of of aloneness. And and treating with a biologic, although there are some medical risks to them, including you know risks of infection, et cetera, um, the risks are, are small, and the risk of not treating is is it has to be weighed. So essentially, if you don't treat someone and and they're um, feeling really badly about their psoriasis or they're um, uh, getting you know potentially psoriatic arthritis, et cetera. Uh, it's important to, um, uh, again, weigh the, the, the risks of not treating. So you mentioned mental health. Um, what happens uh, if youth with psoriasis become violent or aggressive? Is this associated with their disease? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know, I think teenagers, it's hard to be a teenager. Um, there's a lot going on. Their bodies are changing. Their lives are changing. You know, um, friendship groups change all the time. It's just hard to be a teenager. And then you kind of add psoriasis to it. And I think that that can lead to a lot of feelings of, um, of uh, discomfort and itch and potentially uh, feeling social isolation. And again, that doesn't happen to everybody. There, there are lots of people with psoriasis who say, you know, who, who have not had anxiety and depression. So I don't mean to paint it that it happens to everyone, but it certainly um, does happen. Um, um, uh, it certainly can happen. And so when you have anxiety, depression, and you're a 
teenager, that can express itself as violence. And it's not, it's not unreasonable to think that someone, you know, would feel more angry or have more outbursts or, you know, yell at their parents more because of the fact that they, they're um, feeling anxious about their psoriasis. So how would you treat uh, psoriasis in a child that may be on the face or the forehead? Um, so uh, I would probably start with topical um, agents. So things like pomicrolimus and tacrolimus, which I believe are off-label for psoriasis, but used all the time. Um, they are non-steroids. So we'll, we'll typically, you know, on the face or the forehead, start maybe with a low potency steroid for a week or two to try to get things under control. And then we'll switch over in children over two to tacrolimus or pomicrolimus, which are non-steroids, which you can then use more consistently. But if someone has really significant facial psoriasis and they're not getting a lot better, um, especially if they have psoriasis, you know, in other areas, in, including um, uh, areas that are tough to treat with topicals, then you do want to consider whether they might need a biologic agent uh, for having psoriasis that's in such a noticeable area. And it's hard to use topical steroids in this area because there is a risk of glaucoma and thinning out the skin on the face. Um, and the non-steroids are just not quite as potent as topical steroids. So you're in a little catch-22, and, and sometimes you end up having to, to treat more aggressively in those areas. And earlier you mentioned comorbidities. Uh, is severity, you mentioned severity as a factor, but uh, earlier age of onset, does that increase the risk for comorbidities? Yeah, that's a great question too. So probably the longer that you're in flames, probably the higher risk of comorbidities. Um, and then probably the earlier you have it, the more it's kind of genetically programmed to be there. So I don't um, know data that has proven that for sure, but I would imagine if you have more severe psoriasis early on that's longer lasting throughout life, that you have a higher chance of eventually getting some of these comorbidities because of that long lasting nature. And this individual indicates uh, her daughter has psoriasis on her scalp, ears, eyelids, elbows, knees, and groin. She was recently diagnosed with a cardiac issue. Are the two diseases related? So it depends on what the cardiac issue is. Um, in children, there's usually not going to be, you know, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure that is that has led to actual heart disease. You have to have you know, um, cholesterol that's elevated for a while, you have to have blood pressure that's elevated for a while to really lead to um, heart disease, but it's not impossible. If you have someone with really severe psoriasis and they've had it, you know, for a few years, um, it, it, it could be related. It really depends on what the cardiovascular disease is. And, and parents may actually have to update their cardiologist. So um, I do some teaching for the medical school and our course happens to be right after cardiology. And, and often the students are not told that and that psoriasis can lead to cardiovascular disease. So um, things like having high blood pressure, things like having diabetes um, uh, can be psoriasis associated, but they, they also could be independent. And um, uh, it's important to kind of talk to your cardiologist to see whether they think they're related. The other question we really don't know is whether if you treat someone's psoriasis aggressively with systemic therapy, whether we affect their cardiovascular disease. So does it just happen in the same people or is it really that if we turn down the inflammation from the psoriasis that their cardiovascular disease gets better? And we're, we're hoping to see that over time. Okay, great, thank you. And this will now switch to research. Uh, do you have any updates about uh, the development of small molecule topicals? Um, there are small molecule topicals. I have to say that um, I don't know about them as well as probably an adult psoriasis person would because almost all of those pharma companies do these tests in, in adults first. Um, so if pharmacy companies happen to be listening, it would be amazing if you actually trialed your drugs in pediat and children also. Um, we usually get to get the drugs like five years after they're approved in adults. Um, and so we're not as much at the tip of that spear in terms of being able to use those medicines. Um, but yes, there, there are anti-inflammatory medications that are in trials um, that uh, um, hopefully uh, will prove to be effective and hopefully will be uh, eventually able to be used in children. Okay, and a couple more questions. Um, do you feel that eventually psoriasis can be cured? So cure is a hard word because you, you have a medical problem that is, is somewhat genetically programmed. 
And so um, I think it can be extremely well controlled in many people with some of the agents that we have now, but will there be an agent that kind of turns down the genetic predisposition for this type of inflammation? I think that's a little bit harder. I think that's a little farther out in the future or harder to imagine how that's gonna happen. Right now, basically what we do is the body turns on inflammation in order to respond to something. So, you know, maybe they're responding to infection or maybe they're responding to friction or some type of skin damage, or maybe it just randomly turns on. And it's, it's hard to know how to turn off that inflammation. Instead, what we're doing is we're blocking the ways that the inflammation works. So essentially, you know, um, we don't know how to, to reverse how the process started, and that would be really a cure. We more know how to block the process once it's started, and that's really more of a treatment. So I hope so, um, but, I, but I don't know that that's uh, on the horizon really soon. Okay. Great. Well, that at least offers some hope, right? <laughs> yeah. And actually, I mean, if, if, if this talk 15 years ago was we have topicals and they don't work always that well. And we have a couple of new agents that are, you know, that we use and we sometimes use methotrexate and cyclosporin and they, they can have some benefit. But we're hoping for all these new agents. And 2021 is exciting. I mean, there are there are, it seems like every six months there's a new you know, uh, systemic therapy that's put out or a new topical therapy. And, and some of them, again, are only approved in adults, but there have been some effective new topical therapies also um, that uh, that are exciting. But but um, uh, so it, it's it's way better in psoriasis world than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Oh, that's so true. Uh, one last question. Uh, you mentioned that children can either overuse or underuse medications once they take on some responsibility for managing their own care. Are yeah, there no. any resources you use to help them adhere to a treatment regime? That's a great question also. We struggle with this a lot. So there's data to show that even children who are, you know, trying to not have, you know, a transplant rejection or, you know, using medicines that are really life-saving, they, they often will kind of um, forget to use things. So I, I think we need to, you know, talk to the kids on the level that they understand, which is, you know, if I if I talk to my kids and say, uh, hey, you should write down a schedule for, you know, when to take their medicines, they would be like, OK, that's very um, 2005. Um, but if I told them to program it into their phone and have them have it, uh, you know, set an alarm or if I, you know, if you have a smart speaker that, you know, can tell you every day that you're, you know, you should use something. I think we should take advantage of some of the technology that, that um, often children have in order to be able to um, have them um, get reminders. You can also make it fun. So, you know, I've seen people do things like, you know, if they're gonna put on moisturizer or medicine, like put glitter in it so that they just, you know, feel like they're doing something and they're making themselves look cool at the same time. That's obviously not gonna work for a 15 year old. Um, and then, you know, as kids start to take control, I think you have to be careful not to be too hard on them. So they already have psoriasis, they already may not feel so great about, you know, their skin. And you wanna make sure that you're not saying, oh my gosh, you're flaring because you didn't do what you needed to do. You wanna try to kind of work with them and say, you know, um, oh, you're itching and I can see that that spot flared. You know, how about if we work together and we try to, you know, apply it every day for a week together and, and you'll see the benefit and then you'll kind of know that um, if you do this consistently on your own, that you'll you'll see um, uh, how well it works. Um, so I think I think trying to to bond with kids and and um, help them along versus scolding them is probably the best way of doing it. And then in terms of over treating it, you know, I, I wouldn't give you know a kid a couple of tubes of clobetazole and say, hey, um, go treat your psoriasis because they may really overuse that um, and you can absorb enough medication to cause some issues. So I think setting some limits with the really potent medications is important. Definitely. Um, and I think I will go ahead and ask this one last question that came in tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. And they are asking, what about the tremendous, the cost associated with biologics? So that's a great question too. So our medical system, so so first of all, let me deal with cost in two different ways. One is if you are on label for the disease. So for instance, if you're a six-year-old with etaner uh, who is getting a biologic medication, often 
um, the medical pharmaceutical companies will be able to um, have assistance programs. So essentially, your insurance pays what it's going to pay. Your provider hopefully fights with the insurance to try to get the approval for the medication. And then um, uh, if there's extra or if there's extra copays, you want to contact the company and say, do you have an assistance program? They can't do assistance programs for people who are off label, as far as I know. So you couldn't have like a five-year-old trying to get an assistance for secukinumab, as far as I know. But if they're on label, then I believe that that most of the um, uh, biologic companies have assistance programs, which will help with copays. That being said, the medications are still extremely expensive, and I think that's a much bigger kind of conversation than is relevant for this talk. But essentially. Um, uh, the cost of medicine is um, really exorbitant. Um, but the, the argument against that is that the cost of not treating is actually a really huge deal also. So for instance, let's say you have someone on a medication, a biologic medication for psoriasis, and they don't miss five days of school, and they don't come to more doctor's appointments because of the fact that their psoriasis is flaring, and they don't get an infection, and they don't get hospitalized with, you know, um, some severe, you know, side effect from having psoriasis itself, like getting, you know, um, again, a, an infection, or potentially if you're an older person having, you know, associated cardiovascular disease. The treatment with the medicines actually um, saves the health system as well as the patient um, really significant amounts of money um, in some ways, while at the same time the medicines are extremely expensive. So there's there's a pro and con both ways, and um, I wish that the medications were less expensive. I, I wish that there were more kind of access. Um, but you know, from a patient standpoint, I think it's important to know that you can reach out to the um, go to the company's websites and see if there are assistance programs, um, see if there's any kind of um, copay assistance. And from a health system standpoint, there are some benefits to being on medicines that are controlling a disease because the flares of the disease are actually expensive in and of themselves. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Treat, uh, for taking time to answer all the questions we've received and for sharing your expertise about managing psoriasis in children and teens. As I yeah, mentioned earlier, you. it's it's really exciting to see so many new treatment options available for youth or psoriatic arthritis. And as you mentioned, that's expanding year after year. So, um, you know, that's really great to see for our families. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks to the National Psoriasis Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Treat. Have a good holiday. Thanks, you too. Okay, so for resources specific to youth and you as a parent, please visit our spot at psoriasis.org forward slash our hyphen spot. Resources include age appropriate information up to age 18, personal stories, access to ordering a welcome kit, which includes a booklet specifically for teens, or uh, activity booklet for younger kids, school resources, and more. And the Patient Navigation Center is the world's first personalized support center for people impacted by psoriatic disease. If you still have questions, would like additional information about treatment options, need help finding physician, or are having issues with accessing treatments, such as Dr. Treat discussed, contact our Patient Navigation Center by phone or email, as indicated on the screen. You can also contact the Navigation Center to ask about connecting with other parents through the one-to-one -one program or to request a free e-kit, Guide for Managing Your Health Your Way, by calling 1-800-723-9166, option 1, or send a request to psoriasis.org forward slash guide hyphen for hyphen managing hyphen your hyphen health hyphen your way. The URL is posted on the screen. Resources with this e-kit includes information about diagnosing psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, a flare guide and symptom tracker, along with a fact sheet, making a treatment decision. In addition to today's webinar, you can continue to learn more about the management of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in youth through NPS podcast series, Sound Bites, which is available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Ghana, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, or feed service of your choice. You can also access podcasts at the website listed here.
If you'd like to hear more about the Pediatric Psoriasis Management Guidelines, listen to episode number 50 with pediatric dermatologist Dr. Laura Weinley, or you can learn more about good take psoriasis from dermatologist Dr. Stephen Feldman in episode number 106. Thank you again to our sponsors, Amgen, Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, Lilly, and Novartis for their support of today's webinar. After, after you view this webinar, please take the survey via the link you received to provide feedback about the presentation and content. Tell us what you think. We value and appreciate your comments. And finally, you can catch this webinar and other presentations in our webinar archive at psoriasis.org forward slash watch hyphen and hyphen listen. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for joining us to view expanding treatment options for youth with psoriasis.